sometime last spring, a neighbor of mine reached out for help. It was a very simple request. She just needed a ride home from an appointment on a Friday afternoon. Knowing that Friday is my day off, she thought of me and asked if I would be able to give her a ride. Now I was thrilled to get this request. This was a relationship that I had been cultivating for years. With my closest friends all living an hour away, I'd been eager to form relationships closer to home. And this request felt like an affirmation of that work. I was so grateful that this person trusted me enough to ask and that I was able to say yes. It took maybe 15 minutes of my day six months ago, and I still think of the ask and the way it made me feel. Not with any resentment for giving those 15 minutes, but instead with a deep appreciation of how it deepened that relationship. Now, fast forward several months to this fall when I was the one in need of some help. I had a little medical procedure that didn't go quite as planned and left me unable to lift anything, including my kiddos, for nearly a week. My kids are mostly old enough that this isn't a huge problem, except for in the mornings. There is actually a lot of hands-on work that it takes to get a three and five-year-old up, dressed, fed, in the car, and out the door, and there's a lot of lifting. And then I usually do weekday mornings solo as my spouse leaves before we even wake up. So here I am strategizing in my mind about how I'm gonna make this happen. I can wake up extra early so we don't have so we have time for everything to take twice as long. It'll be a great chance, I think, for Hosea to practice climbing in and out of his car seat, a skill I want him to have anyway. Maybe I think I can get Tristan to pack the bags and leave them in the car before he leaves. I had so many good hacks planned. I had it all figured out but none of them included reaching outside the walls of my home for help. Despite the fact that I had this very clear memory of how good it felt for someone else to reach out to me for help, I was stuck in the idea that I didn't want to be a burden to others, that I should be able to do it all on my own, that receiving generosity is a sign of weakness. Now, don't worry, this story ends happily. My mom finally convinced me to call my sister, who did in fact come all the way up from Boston early in the morning to help me, and had no sense of resentment or disdain at my need for assistance. In fact, she now looks back at that day and thinks about how cool it was to see where my kids go to school and to get to take part in our morning routine. But I am still struck that my gut reaction to needing help was that I wasn't allowed to ask for it. That inviting people to be generous to me was a burden, despite all the evidence to the contrary. And I'm pretty certain that if the same thing happened to me today, my first reaction would still be that I don't deserve that generosity. So many of us are stuck in the notion that it's better to give than to receive. When we learn about the value of generosity, the focus is so often on what we can give, what we can offer from our abundance. We give short shrift to the receiving side of things, naming it as selfish or needy, or as something that we don't deserve. And yet there can be no giving without receiving, no generosity without someone there to accept that generosity. We cannot all always be the giver. Without the ability to receive, we lose out on the spiritual gift of generosity altogether. Researcher and storyteller Bramne Brown says, until we can receive with an open heart, we are never really giving with an open heart. When we attach judgment to receiving help, we knowingly or unknowingly attach judgment to giving help. In our culture, we've come to equate success with not needing anyone, 
Many of us are willing to extend a helping hand, but we're very reluctant to reach out for help when we need it ourselves. It's as if we've divided the world into those who offer help and those who need help. The truth is, she says, we are both. I would say to live fully into the spirit of generosity, we need to be both. That song we sing each week that you've already heard a couple times today speaks plainly to that this two-sided nature of generosity. From you, I receive. To you, I give. Together, we share. And from this, we live. I have to think that there must be some reason that in this song, the receiving part comes first. It does not say that first you have to give and then you deserve to receive. Instead, it puts the recipient first, calling us in this way back to our theology of inherent worth. That we are in fact already worthy to receive before we have done anything. We don't have to earn that worth. We don't have to earn the right to receive help and care. We are born worthy of love and care, of kindness and generosity, of receiving all the gifts of this world. I often hear people say that the hardest part of our Unitarian Universalist belief in the inherent worth, in inherent worth is seeing that worth in people who do terrible things or in the people with whom we have the most disagreements. But I actually think that the hardest part of believing in inherent worth is applying it to ourselves. Not only does everyone else in the world have that worth, so too do you. And in turn, I think the hardest part of generosity is not being generous to others, but rather being generous to ourselves. There seems to be this disconnect in the way we perceive the actions of others and the way we perceive our own actions, even when they are identical. I had no judgment of my neighbor when she reached out for help, only respect and care. And yet when I was the one who needed help, I felt weak and needy, like I was a burden. I was able to be generous in my judgment of another person, but when I was in the same situation, I struggled to find that generosity for myself. I wonder if any of you have ever had that experience. My therapist's favorite trick when I am not being generous enough with myself is to use the fact that I'm a minister against me, by which I mean, she will ask me, so if one of your congregants came to you and had done whatever the thing is that I'm judging myself for, would you tell them what you are telling yourself right now? To which of course my reaction is always, oh, you have caught me again in my own terrible form of hypocrisy. It is annoying, but very effective at getting me to recognize the definite dissonance between the generosity I offer to others and that which I am able to offer to myself. Now this was the exact point I had gotten to in my sermon writing this week prior to getting COVID. When all of a sudden, this theory that has been rolling around in my head for the past week had to come into practice. Talk about preaching to yourself, right? <laughs> Because of course, after I spent a good chunk of the morning yesterday asking people to do stuff for me, which was hard enough, I spent the rest of the day yesterday thinking to myself, oh my goodness, when am I gonna finish that sermon? Why can't I get myself to finish that darn sermon? I should rest, but I really need to finish that sermon. Otherwise, I'm gonna disappoint everyone. So I come to you this morning in the thick of practicing generosity to myself, in the midst of saying, wow, sometimes life gets in the way and I really can't do all the things. And trying to believe myself that it is okay. And I hope that in coming to you in this way, it makes it easier for you to do that as well. And let me tell you, 
It's not easy. It's really hard. Too often, we are wired to be our own worst critics, to hold ourselves to such higher standards than we would anyone else, and to berate ourselves when we can't live up to those impossible ideals. Now, I don't have it all figured out yet. I can tell you that for sure. But I say all this to invite you into the messiness of it alongside me. If we are going to unlearn the harmful patterns of self-judgment that our society has taught us, we have to start by being able to admit that we don't have it all together and to find solidarity in our not togetherness, in our imperfection. We know in our hearts that success is not equal to not needing anyone, no matter what our world has to say about it. But we need to start to train our brains too. And all of it takes practice. This is practice we can do every day. It's the practice of saying yes when help is offered. The practice of reaching out for help when you need it. The practice of saying thank you instead of, oh, you didn't need to do that. The practice of accepting a compliment rather than brushing it off. The practice of loving ourselves, offering ourselves grace and forgiveness, accepting our imperfections as an integral part of the beautiful mess of life. The practice of remembering that inherent worth means you too that you too are already worthy of love and acceptance, of kindness and generosity. So this month, as we explore generosity together, I invite you to join me first in these practices, the practices of generosity that start with yourself, knowing as we do that we all still have a lot to learn. May it be so.